Ja. So, hello everybody. I'm Dmitry Levin, the maintainer of Stress, and today I'll talk about a new Stress feature called Syscall Fault Injection. Uh, so, does anybody know what a stress is? Uh, <laughs> nice! So, as most of you know, a stress is a traditional uh, diagnostic debugging and instructional user space utility for Linux. Uh, how traditional is 25 years old, so quite traditional. And traditionally, it's used to monitor interactions between user space process and Linux kernel. Uh, the most known are system calls uh, and also signal deliveries, uh, changes of process state. A trace has traditional, everything is traditional with Stray's. Uh, it has traditional command line interface and multiple filtering capabilities. So because the interface is traditional, it's easy to use for people who are used to this uh, for 20 something years. And it's quite powerful because of this filtering capabilities. But last year, a trace has been extended to do something very untraditional. Uh, that is to tamper with traces by injection faults. It's so-called syscall fault injection. Uh, the current implementation is based on the work made by GSOC student of last, last year, Nahim El Mani. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, so I'm sorry if it's wrong. He will some, someday correct me. Um, so, what is a fault injection? Just a brief recollection. Uh, it's a software testing technique used for improving test coverage, uh, mostly of error handling paths that might otherwise rarely be followed by introducing faults. Uh, this is a nice definition from Wikipedia. Thanks to Wikipedia for this. Uh, so where do we place a stress among other uh, fault injection tools? It's obviously software, it's runtime, most of instrumentation tools are compile time. This is runtime. It does its work by means of syscall interposition. It's user space, it, unlike many current techniques we have. It's unprivileged, and as I said, it has traditional command line interface. So now I'll show you a series of examples that hopefully will get you an idea what the syscall fault ejection syntax is and what you could do with it. And I'll start with a simple program, cat from Core Utils, which is linked dynamically with MLBC, and we will see what could be done. So in the top box you see a traditional output, and in the bottom box uh, something with fault ejection. So let's filter off all Let's fill the all open uh, syscalls of this trivial command. And let's fail them all. What you can see here, that this thing ends in dynamic linker. It tries to open its cache, it fails. It tries to open libc in predefined locations. On this architecture, there are four locations in this build of libc. And it fails, nothing very, it's quite predictable. Uh, let's do something, something different. Uh, let's change error code that dynamic linker will get uh, from default one, which is in a C's function not implemented, to something that has a different meaning for for dynamic linker. Uh, as you see, it tries twice as many locations when it sees error code in the end. the error code of open syscall. Uh, you can inject fault not on all invocations, but just in the first one or whatever else. So if you inject a fault just to the first invocation, uh, you can see that dynamic linker just does all, all the same. It 
tries Lipsy in different locations, finds it, and everything works. But if you fail second and all subsequent invocations, what happens? Uh, dynamic linker opens its cache and tries to open libc according to the cache. As you see, it fails. And then it tries all these predefined locations. And you can notice that it tries libc, it tries to open libc at the same location it tried before. Why, why dynamic linker does this? Because there are different code paths and they don't know about each other. In the first path it tries to open, and in another code path it also tries to open, and it doesn't care, but it's already tried this. It's not a bug, just a funny thing. Uh, let's, let's dynamic linker do its work and have a look at the cat itself. So the third open syscall is the syscall made, made by uh, cat itself. And it looks like what you would expect from a cat. It fails and it exits with error code. Uh, another way you can specify faults is to say how often you would to uh, inject them. For example, you can inject them starting with third one, uh, with third, and then every second one. So you see that cat handles the situation, I would say properly, so it reports error on every case when there is an error and processes everything that's, that's opened and exits with error code, so looks like cat works fine. And now let's have a look at something more interesting. Let's combine uh, fault injection with path filtering. So in the top box, you see a sequence of syscalls that are related to the files passed to cat, dev now in this case. And in the bottom, I'll just fail each of these syscalls, so we'll see how cat handles this. So the first one we've already seen, and the second one is fstat, and for some reason, cat considers this as an error. It's quite an unusual thing that fstat fails, so probably it's the same thing to do is to fail everything. Uh, from another side, uh, the, the f advice is called, it's, it's advice. So cat is also quite right that it ignores this error. It's just an advice to kernel that cat is going to do some sub, uh, sequential reads. Uh, what uh, more or less the same with read. If you fail a read with a hard error, it's quite right to report it and, and fail. But what do you think cat will do if it sees a temporary error? Would it restart a read or would it fail? It would restart. Cat is a good program after all, and it knows that interrupted system call is a temporary error that should be restarted. So, and this is a peculiar thing. And this is a, then you fail close to skull that has no importance. What cat does? It just opens file, processes it, and closes it. It's open, it opens it read only, and What's the use of reporting this as a hard error when, it, when you can't close a file open read only? I don't know. I would say it's a minor bug in CAT, very minor, to complain and exit with error code. It's because the, the file was successfully processed from the beginning to the end, so why does it? Uh, here you can see in brief that you can specify different fault injection expressions that would work and in the top box. And in the second box you see that a trace actually can follow descriptors. Uh, so even if CAD ha has no idea what the file 
it's working with a stretch does know and can apply its filters so it's like what what you can see in the bottom box it's a primitive uh, like primitive access control using a stress and let's have a look at real bugs uh, this is a more or less famous bug in Python 3.5 and it's, it was found by the student who did this GSOC project uh, Python on every invocation needs some randomness for instantization and when it fails to obtain this randomness it's a fatal error which is fine probably but it's not fine that it throws a segmentation <coughs> fault at hexadecimal address 50 uh, it's not not good it's a bug uh, why it does this ridiculous thing uh, because it addresses uh, a method of an uh, object which was not allocated because of lack of randomness. Uh, so hexadecimal address is just offset in a virtual table like this. Fortunately, uh, this bug was seems to be at least fixed in Python 3.6. First, they were work around with it by using Get random she's call, but I actually tried to fault get random and find found out that it no longer sick faults. That's funny thing anyway. And another real bug was found with dynamic linker itself. So if you fail and protect, uh, you can see that. Dynamic linker from libc ignores error from the first and protect error, but it treats all subsequent errors as fatal. It's quite natural to do so with all subsequent, but why it ignores the first error? It's because there are different code paths, and the only code path that exists in current libc's dynamic linker is the one that's early in its running and it just ignores the error and this error actually can happen for example because of fragmentation and the, the call that, that's failed is the one that tries to to remove access it's brought none so actually some some pages are remains to be accessible which are supposed not to be so it's light, like it would be a, a, a minor security issue if it's not a, mm, a mandatory problem because if first and protect call fails, it's very likely that all subsequent also fail and they are properly handled. But still, it's a bug. Uh, now uh, I'll try to uh, explain you what's going on under the hood and how it's all implemented. So when traces invokes this is call kernel puts it in so-called uh, syscall enter stop state so it's completely stopped uh, at the same time as trace awakens it fetches syscall number its arguments applies filters you've seen on all other kinds of filters as trace supports it decides and may either skip this syscall or print something and then it tells the kernel to go on with trace tracing then kernel executes this is call and before passing control to to user space it puts traces again in a stop state it's a slightly different state it's called this is called exit stop uh, at this time a trace awakens again it may fetch this is called return code and arguments it depend it depends whether the the call is filtered or not also it prints at this time this return code if necessary and tells kernel to let the tracy go on and all this cycle repeats itself until something happens with tracy when it exits or whatever so taking these two parts together you can see the sequence 
and in this sequence there are two places where a stress actually can temper the syscall. With syscall number, with syscall arguments, with syscall return code. And this is exactly the way how syscall fault injection is implemented. So on entering syscall, a stress replaces syscall number with an invalid one, minus one, and then kernel sees this invalid syscall. It's, it's just invalid syscall, so it returns an error for the invalid syscall, which is in a sys on most architectures, but not on all of them, so you shouldn't rely on this error code. And then on exiting syscall, if instructed to replace error code, it, it replaces this error code with the one that was specified. So it's actually pretty simple inside. But this is not the only thing, as you can see from this slide, it's not the only thing that could be done, not just syscall fault injection, but other kinds of injections, uh, tamperings. For example, this is some recent development, not, not in released, released uh, stress version yet. You can inject a, a signal at, at any of these points, and uh, current implementation, it's injected on <coughs> on exiting, I think, yeah. On exiting syscall. So, uh, what would you use this signal injection for? For example, if you want to terminate program, you would you would probably use a different signal for this, or if you want to dump it for for the analysis by another tool like GDB, uh, and another the way you can tamper with is to replace a return code of syscall with something that doesn't look like a, an error actually. So you can pretend that syscall completed successfully, but actually skip it. So by replacing syscall number on entering to an invalid one, this way you skip the syscall, and on exiting you can replace a return code with like zero, which for syscalls like unlink means it's, everything is fine. So the tracer will suppose that unlink su completes successfully and the file is gone, but it's actually, yeah. This is not as easy as it looks. Uh, as for more complicated syscalls, they have some semantics that has to be uh, uh, followed some, somehow. For example, um, many syscalls, when they succeed, uh, some portions of memory are filled with some useful information by the kernel. So for them, this is not as easy. But for simple syscalls like Unlink, it's work from current master. Uh, probably I forgot to tell that the, the, this API Astrace is using is called Ptrace. It's the same API used by, uh, it's a traditional in interface, <laughs> as I think about Strace. So it's the same that's used by GDB. Uh, it's more or less that all I would like to tell about fault injection, but I can answer your questions because some, some things are better answered in questions. So, uh, by the way, the title of this talk was probably invented by the student who made this GSOC project. You can visit his uh, GSOC page and maybe you'll get an idea what was planned in the beginning and how it's changed it and compare these things. You can grab the source. Uh, Syscall fault injection is part of the recent release, which was in December, I think. So it's, you can use it. 
Uh, do you have any? Um, I'm kind of curious if are, are there testing tools you have seen that are built on top of the fault injection in S trace now? Uh, so this fault injection uh, makes S trace a testing tool, but I, it's quite a, a modern thing, so I'm not sure it's already widely used as a testing tool. Uh, I'm, start, I'm thinking of using a stress itself for a stress tissue because it's not easy to reproduce some faults uh, related to uh, P trace system call, for example. Uh, that's <laughs> so just a new way of fault injection, a new way of testing something that's otherwise would require uh, a compile time instrumentation. And it's probably the only uh, runtime unprivileged user space uh, for the injection tool for Linux we have now. So uh, I think it's time to ask questions. So which one of slides? So, you'll, uh, uh, so here, the card is unable to open linker. Probably so the question, one. the question was, how card was able to, to complain about, uh, how how card was able to, uh, to report an error if linker was unable to load libc. It's not a card. It, the error diagnostics you see uh, comes from dynamic linker. Uh, it's not a. It's still a dynamic linker okay. at this point. So y you can see uh, the prefix is cat, but it's not a cat. It's dynamic linker who complains that it can't op load libc. And okay. that's all. Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, do you know why, uh, why we use an invalid syscall number? Uh, first of all, I've been told, uh, so the question is uh, why uh, the current implementation uses an invalid syscall number for fault injection instead of using some harmless uh, syscall that has no side effects so that a monitoring system like a C Linux wouldn't, or, the, or something like this, uh, audit with it, wouldn't complain about something wrong is going on. Uh, first of all, it's not easy to find a harmless syscall. I've been told yes, recently that getpid may fail. In current Linux kernels, getpid may fail. It's not allowed. Okay, so in theory, it's possible to uh, invoke a getpid. I think it's not a technical issue, but from optimization point of view, uh, it's less probably less work. Uh, less uh, you will need ne less uh, syscall invocations to do this uh, on. On exiting syscall, you'll have to re replace like two registers on some architectures, and in case of invalid syscall, you will not have to replace at least the register that uh, contains the indication that it's an error. So it's slightly, it, I think it's slightly 
faster to use an invalid syscall. But I think it's quite a valid point. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Really? Okay, ah, yes, please. Uh, is there already something uh, there, uh, probably external to S case, uh, to do random, like fuzzing stuff that random read some syscall uh, uh, fail? So the question, as I heard it, uh, was is there anything probably external from S case that do some uh, random? What's a random injection? A random it's what? Random, yeah. uh, it's so, it's in the initial GSOC design, there was a, 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 an interface to do some random injection, but later I decided that it's better done by a fuzzy driver that runs a trace. So, my idea is that if you want randomness, you just do it in a driver that runs a trace and not in a trace itself. So currently this injection is predictable. Uh, there is no mm, random injection. But it m might change if somebody would suggest a, mm, a plausible case how, to, how this would be used. Because currently I think it's better done in a fuzzy driver. Outside. But, but the command line will get very long, and if you have a real life application, uh, the command line will have tens of thousands of things <coughs> where to fail or where not to fail. Is it a problem that the command line uh, is long? <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any more questions? Yes, please. I'm not sure I hear anything, but I will have to repeat what you're saying. So please make it hearable at least for me. Not so much a question, more comments. It's really cool stuff. It's very, very good. Very, very helpful. Thank you. And pass on the thanks to the GSOC team as well. Okay, so Steve said that it's a. Well, you probably have seen it. This is like just a good words about this. I'm not going to repeat this. Thank you. So coming up next in this room, we have a quick talk on testing web applications.